Well, good evening. Uh, two years ago, we heard about uh, a project that I think was one of the real, real great examples of international cooperation, the Alpha, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is a, uh, a particle detector, state-of-the-art particle detector. And uh, it's a $1.5 billion program. Uh, it is, involves 500 scientists from 56 institutions in 16 countries. And all those countries have gone together and funded that experiment, including the United States. But I think uh, it's a great example of international cooperation. And it uh, brought together also Taiwan and China. And they're both involved in the program. Uh, they don't work together on many things or anything, but they're working together on this program. And at that point in time when we heard about it, uh, it was they were struggling to get it flown on uh, by NASA on the space shuttle. And there was some question as to whether it would be flown. But uh, a year ago, it was flown. It was launched on Space Shuttle Endeavor on May 15th. And on May 19th, a year ago tonight, that was installed on the space station. So we're celebrating really the, the first, first year anniversary. And the individual that is uh, gonna speak to us, Dr. Maurice Brignan, is, uh, is an individual that's been working on this for the last 17 years. And uh, he's involved with uh, Dr. Samuel Ting, uh, who's a principal investigator. Uh, Maurice is uh, the uh, ex-president of the University of Geneva ex-president of the CERN Council and uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Geneva today. And uh, they've been in operation now uh, for a year gathering data. So Maurice is going to talk to us tonight about uh, what the experiment is and what the results are so far. So Maurice. Thank you, George. <clears throat> Ladies and, and gentlemen, it is a, a great uh, privilege to share with you uh, today the status of the uh, uh, AMS, uh, the uh, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer experiments on the uh, International uh, Space Station. And I do that on behalf of the uh, AMS uh, collaboration, which, uh, as George said, consists of uh, scientists from institutes and universities of, uh, of 16 countries. One year uh, in space is indeed uh, an important uh, milestone. Uh, and please note that uh, throughout my uh, presentation, which uh, I hope will uh, come on the, on the screen there, uh, I will uh, uh, see that uh, two elements uh, uh, dominate. Uh, one of them is the international uh, collaboration, which is uh, needed to uh, study fundamental questions in our society uh, and to resolve uh, many serious uh, issues, uh, not only uh, in science. I see this element, in fact, uh, fully integrated here in the work of the Institute of the College and, uh, and the Summit. I will also be talking about what we call blue skies uh, research, where serendipity uh, is important. Uh, the output of the research, uh, fundamental research, is not uh, always uh, uh, predictable. Uh, but of course, uh, as we've heard uh, at lunch today, one should not oppose uh, basic research and applied research. I would in fact say that uh, there is applied research and not yet uh, applied research. The uh, alpha magnetic uh, spectrometer experiment uh, consists of uh, uh, a box, a container, uh, which you see here represented as uh, it was sitting uh, more than a year ago at uh, Kennedy Space Center, waiting uh, for the shuttle to launch it. It is uh, uh, a block of uh, dimension 15 by 12 by 9 feet, weighing uh, seven and a half ton. Uh, and the inside uh, is uh, full of detectors and uh, electronic circuits. There are about 300,000 electronic channels and 650 processors. 
Uh, I heard uh, yesterday that uh, what you present here, in fact, has to be compared in Texas to a football field. Uh, and I had uh, to think uh, how to compare the size of this detector to a football field, but uh, I found the answer. This detector was uh, assembled, finally assembled in, in Geneva in Switzerland. And uh, to carry it uh, from Geneva to uh, Kennedy Space Center, uh, it was installed in, the, in, in a US Air Force C-5 Galaxy plane. And this plane uh, is about, uh, in length, three quarter of a, of a football field. <laughs> uh, so is its uh, wing uh, span. This uh, experiment, as it was said, uh, includes uh, scientists in, uh, in many countries. You see um, universities uh, from the US, uh, from uh, Europe, and from uh, Asia being represented. Uh, it is a US uh, DOE-led uh, collaboration, um, but must, much of the detectors have been built and been, have been financed by the international uh, partners. And I would like uh, today to acknowledge the continuous support and strong support we have seen, we see from you, George, uh, and from Neil Lane, and from the NASA people, from uh, the bottom to the top of the of, of the ladder. Uh, this experiment uh, uh, is indeed uh, based on uh, a search of uh, a fundamental phenomena in science, uh, and more specifically, it deals with uh, cosmic rays. Uh, cosmic rays uh, are a large part of the matter and uh, element and, ma and energy in our universe, in fact. They are traveling uh, through space, and uh, some of those cosmic rays reach uh, our, our region, the Earth, and one can uh, separate uh, the cosmic rays into two uh, kinds. Uh, there are neutral, electrically, electrically neutral uh, cosmic rays, uh, light rays, and uh, neutrinos which have been uh, observed and uh, uh, measured uh, for over 50 years, like, for example, on the uh, Hubble Space uh, Telescope. And fundamental discoveries have been made uh, with uh, light rays and, and neutrinos. And there are charged, uh, electrically charged particles, cosmic rays, uh, which are more difficult to, to study for us, since uh, when they come in to the Earth, they interact with the atmosphere and they are uh, destroyed or, or, transf or, or transformed, so that uh, they are studied, uh, they have been studied with balloon experiment and small uh, satellite. But with the uh, AMS, the magnetic spectrometer on the ISS, we have a unique way now to uh, provide uh, a precision long term, hopefully 10 to 20 years on the space station, if uh, the space station can uh, last that long. We, we hope so that uh, we can continue to do those measurements for a very long time uh, so that uh, we can uh, make precise measurements on uh, such particles that you see here. Uh, cosmic rays consist of uh, uh, essentially all the uh, elementary uh, particles, uh, electrons and, and positrons. Positrons are the uh, anti-matter uh, correspondent particle to the electron. Those are electrons with a, a positive charge. Protons, antiprotons, and the various uh, nuclei, uh, and possibly uh, the presence of uh, anti-nuclei. Uh, the uh, discovery of cosmic rays dates back to 100 uh, years. And uh, we have a similar uh, situation here in, in, uh, in at Rice University, which was also uh, funded uh, in the same year as uh, uh, Victor Hess uh, went on a balloon uh, to a height of about 5,000 meters to observe uh, something that uh, uh, later on was called uh, cosmic rays. In 1932, uh, the positron, the anti-electron, was uh, discovered in cosmic rays. In 1947, uh, the pion, which decays in muon and electron, this was discovered also uh, in cosmic rays, uh, in, uh, but detected in a photographic emulsion. Later on, uh, many uh, different type of particles were observed, but they were observed with uh, man-made uh, accelerators, uh, uh, while the previous uh, cosmic rays uh, are, of course, accelerated by phenomena uh, in the universe, which we don't still uh, understand fully. Uh, uh, when the masses of those particles increases, 
the, the cost of the accelerators to produce them increases. So now we come to a point where uh, the uh, space, again, uh, is a good uh, uh, environment uh, to uh, study fundamental uh, uh, particle in space. Of course, uh, uh, there are many such particles, quarks, neutron, meson, etc. And uh, all those down, down particles uh, you can see, uh, it's clearly a, a problem. Uh, so uh, those gentlemen, I think, have found a, a, a way to be able to see them. And uh, uh, I hope I can also uh, benefit from the Cabernet Sauvignon that uh, we're having tonight after, after this talk to see those particles a little bit uh, better. Uh, where do those uh, particles that constitute our universe come from? Uh, they come from, from a fluctuation of uh, the vacuum before there was anything uh, in the universe, just vacuum, that's 13 billion years ago. And uh, after this uh, so-called Big Bang, particles uh, were created, elements were created, uh, stars, uh, life, uh, essentially. And this took uh, 13 billion years. So uh, looking at uh, this uh, beginning here and uh, understanding the law of physics as we do today, we must uh, assume that uh, antiparticles were also produced so that the symmetry of the universe was, was conserved at the very beginning. However, uh, as you know, we don't see those uh, uh, original uh, antimatter uh, particles in our solar system, even in our galaxy. Uh, we don't know where they are. So either they are somewhere in the universe and uh, we would like to try to, to find them, or they have disappeared by a process that we still do not uh, uh, understand. Now, if AMS on, is on the space station for a long time, uh, like 10 or 20 years, uh, looking for uh, particles, uh, uh, we uh, believe that uh, uh, we can uh, say definitely if there are still uh, antimatter, primordial antimatter in the universe and, uh, up to the, its uh, edge. So this was the primary motivation for the construction of this experiment. Now in the last uh, uh, decade or so, another fundamental problem has been, has been discovered. It is the fact that uh, all this matter and possibly antimatter uh, consist of uh, particles which uh, form, it seems, only a very small fraction of the matter and the energy of the universe, about 4%. The rest uh, is unknown. Uh, and part of it has been called dark matter. That is, uh, it is uh, made of uh, possibly objects which are non-luminous, so you don't see them in the sky, but they have an influence, a very large influence, on the motion of the stars and, and the galaxy. Uh, the uh, hypothesis that we have now is that uh, this dark matter is made of particles which we have not discovered. They have very weak interaction, but they can interact uh, within uh, themselves in order to produce particles that we know, that is, pairs of particle and antiparticles. So the antiparticles which would be produced by those annihilation, we would be able to detect uh, with uh, AMS. And a third topic I would like to mention is the fact that uh, uh, we know that uh, the elements, the nuclei that uh, are uh, known on, on, on Earth and in space are made from <coughs> two types of quarks, the D quarks and the, uh, and the U quark. Uh, while there are some other quarks uh, which can be produced artificially and uh, maybe some of the uh, matter uh, in, in space can uh, include uh, so-called strangelets, that is uh, elements consisting of uh, three quarks, and there's a way to distinguish those type of, uh, of elements by looking at the ratio of their charge to their atomic number. So this is also a goal uh, of, uh, of AMS. Now, uh, in order to build uh, this experiment, uh, uh, we had to master the various technologies that uh, we wanted to transfer from particle physics in a uh, lab in, on the ground to a uh, similar experiment in space. And we had the uh, chance to uh, perform a precursor mission uh, on STS-91 in 1998. 
and you see here the precursor uh, AMS in the cargo bay of, uh, of Discovery. Uh, this is a picture which was taken uh, from the Mir uh, station uh, while uh, it orbited uh, for, for uh, 10 days uh, uh, in, uh, in orbit around the Earth. Uh, based on this uh, experience, uh, we have uh, constructed here uh, a detector, and you see a cutoff of this detector, and I should tell you briefly what it consists of. We would like to detect particles which uh, traverse uh, this detector from top to bottom here, uh, identifying uh, the characteristics of particles, which are essentially the electric charge Z and the energy, which is also related to the momentum. And we would like to do this uh, uh, in many uh, possibilities so that uh, we are uh, convinced and sure that uh, we make uh, precise measurements. So, for example, the top detector here called TRD identifies electrons and, and positrons. Uh, we have a time of flight system which consists of scintillators uh, here and here. One measures the velocity uh, of the particle uh, over this uh, one meter distance. Uh, this measures also the charge and the energy of the particles. We have uh, a, a magnet which is located in this region. It has a shape of a donut uh, with an uh, opening, an open bore, so that particles traverse uh, this uh, magnet, are deflected by its magnetic field, deflected one way or deflected the other way, depending on the electric charge of the, of the particle. Uh, uh, and within this magnet, is a series of, uh, of uh, detectors called silicon uh, tracker. They are made uh, of thin uh, wafers of silicon which can uh, identify uh, the passage of a particle and measure very precisely uh, their track. Uh, near the bottom, there is a, a, a counter which can again measure the charge uh, and the energy uh, of the particles. And finally, at the bottom, uh, another detector, a calorimeter, which can identify electron, positron, and high energy gamma rays. So you see there are redundant uh, measurements of the charged particle that uh, cross uh, this detector. Uh, let me just briefly mention two uh, uh, important properties in order to make the measurements at which I, uh, I had alluded to. For example, uh, what is very important is that we can uh, uh, identify particle over antiparticle and, for example, uh, detect uh, anti-helium if anti-helium is still present in, the, uh, in, the, in, in our orbit. Uh, and we would like to be able to identify anti-helium in one part of 10 to the 10 with respect to helium. So one must be able to uh, uh, be sure that the tracks we see does not uh, uh, come from a helium particle, helium nucleus, uh, making a, 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 a scattering. So one has to have minimal amount of material uh, in this uh, region and make several uh, measurements of its uh, uh, momentum. Another characteristic is to be able to add separate uh, electrically charged particle like proton and positron since we would like to detect uh, and measure a positron and we need uh, a separation power of 10 to the 6 which means that uh, we need independent measurement of uh, this uh, ratio in uh, two detectors separated by a magnetic field so that we can multiply uh, the uh, separation power uh, of those two uh, detectors. Uh, the uh, magnet is uh, represented here. This is a, a device which we have flown in the precursor flight uh, 12 years ago. Uh, we had measured its field. We have measured the field uh, uh, again, the magnetic field, and we see that uh, the field has not uh, changed over those years, so we are confident that with this magnet we can make measurements over very long uh, time. Uh, you see here a container. This is the container where the magnet is located. You see the free ball here. Well, not so free now because there are people installing here in this picture uh, scintillation counters. And those counters installed uh, around the magnet here make sure that uh, we are not fooled by particles which would traverse the magnet and uh, make interaction uh, rather than going straight down the ball. Uh, the time of flight system consists of uh, 
uh, scintillation counters uh, at the top and the bottom of the magnet. And we have uh, calibrated uh, this time of flight system to make measurements uh, at, uh, uh, pres with a precision of 160 uh, picosecond. Uh, and at the same time, this, uh, de this detector uh, allows to uh, identify the various uh, uh, nuclei from helium to the uh, calcium uh, uh, region. The transition radiation detector at the top uh, consists of uh, modules uh, which uh, are formed with uh, fiber fleece and uh, uh, tubes, straw tubes, so that when the particle like a proton crosses this detector, it leaves a signal uh, in a tube here, while a, a lighter particle like an electron or positron leaves a, a signal, but also produces what is called transition radiation, so that uh, the signal from an electron or a positron in this detector is larger than for a proton, uh, allowing to discriminate between uh, those two types of, uh, of particles. Inside the magnet, there is this set of, uh, of planes uh, of, of silicon, uh, which um, give signal allowing to track the particle uh, inside the magnet. And the <coughs> resolution uh, of one of those uh, detectors is uh, better than 10 micrometer, so it's a very precise uh, detector to detect the tracking of, of the particle. And at the same time, this uh, detector uh, can also measure the electric charge uh, of uh, the uh, particles. This uh, tracking detector is made of silicon wafers. Uh, you see them here uh, under the microscope with a 10 mil pitch. Uh, all those uh, strips here have been uh, uh, bonded to uh, electronic circuits, and we have done this in our institute in Italy uh, and in, uh, in, in Switzerland. The ring imaging Cherenkov count counter consists of an aerogel radiator. When a particle traverses this uh, radiator, it emits a light, a Cherenkov light, which is detected by 10,000 photosensors, and uh, the light is distributed over uh, cones, uh, the intersection of which are uh, circles, and the uh, density of the photons detected is a function of uh, the uh, nucleus type and the uh, uh, radius uh, of those uh, uh, circles uh, is a function of the velocity of the particle. So again here we can identify various uh, nuclei <coughs> and measure their, their velocity. And finally, at the bottom, you have what we call a calorimeter. Uh, it is a system of uh, 50,000 optical fibers, uh, which are uh, inside uh, 1,200 uh, pounds of, of lead, so that when uh, an electron or a positron or a gamma ray traverses that, it stops in there, loses all its energy, and we can measure the energy of this particle with a 3% uh, resolution. Now, all those detectors have to be read out, so we have a, a, a system of, uh, of uh, computers, 650 uh, computers, which are uh, located uh, behind those uh, radiators on, on, on IMS. Uh, we have to read 300,000 channels, and of course, we have a lot of redundancy, since we cannot uh, intervene uh, in space to, to change any, any, any circuit. Uh, this is an example of one of the, of the circuit. This is for reading the silicon tracker. You see the, the nine uh, planes here. They produce uh, 200,000 uh, channels of pulse height, that is uh, analog information, which has to be uh, digitized. One has to uh, look for the center of gravity of, uh, of signals, so we need a, a computation before this is sent uh, to the uh, final uh, computers uh, on board. Now, all those systems were tested I individually by the various groups in different parts of the world, and when it was finally put together, uh, it was, this was done uh, at CERN in Geneva, and we installed uh, twice this uh, detector uh, in a beam of particle uh, at the center of, uh, of a po possibly a famous uh, collider. This is the LHC uh, collider. Uh, at CERN, so we uh, tested this uh, and calibrated this detector 
and we uh, observed that indeed uh, the resolution of the silicon tracker uh, is of the order of 10 micrometer. The velocity uh, of particle is measured to one part in 1,000. The uh, energy calibration is uh, correct to about 3%, and we can reject uh, protons when we are looking for electron or positron uh, with a proper rejection uh, uh, power. So when all this was, uh, was ready, then uh, uh, the team of astronauts of STS-134 uh, came <coughs> to Switzerland to look at uh, the uh, detector. But the first thing they asked when they arrive at 7 o'clock in the morning by, by the flight from uh, Newark, they asked her to go to the mountains. So uh, what, uh, what I did with them is to go to the uh, Aiguille du Midi, close to the Mont Blanc. Uh, they were equipped with a camp crampon and uh, proper shoes and uh, they had some part of their training then uh, uh, in, the, in the Alps. Uh, then, uh, as George said, uh, uh, last year, a year ago, uh, the launch uh, took place, and uh, uh, very shortly afterwards, AMS was installed by the astronauts on the, on the main truss of the uh, space station. Um, you, see it, uh, you see it here. It was uh, plugged, um, the electric uh, co connection and the data connection were plugged in, and uh, a few hours later, the data uh, starting, uh, started flowing. Uh, today, uh, the detector is functioning uh, as designed, and in 12 months of data taking, we have collected uh, 16 uh, billion uh, events, and we're going to do, continue to do that year after year. So this will provide, of course, very sensitive uh, uh, results in, uh, in the physics we would like to do. Uh, we have, uh, as you, as you, you heard, uh, a, a system of data acquisition uh, on board. Uh, the data uh, flows at the rate uh, where we chose the uh, particles we would like to uh, study. This is uh, two kilohertz um, uh, round in, in orbit. And the data uh, are then uh, sent uh, through uh, a laptop uh, in the uh, cosmonaut uh, astronaut uh, uh, region to the TDRS uh, satellite system uh, through uh, KU band, the high rate data link to White Sands uh, in New Mexico, to uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, and finally to, to Geneva, where we have the payload operation uh, control center. Uh, now uh, we can do the opposite. We can uh, command uh, AMS from this control room and send through the uh, S-band uh, commands uh, to be able to uh, change uh, parameters on, uh, on AMS when, uh, when this is uh, necessary. Now notice that uh, uh, the rate which is written here for the high uh, rate is uh, about 10 megabit per second. And this is uh, rather small compared to the very large number of channels that we have uh, in the detector. So uh, you must realize that uh, we have to reduce the data by a factor of 1,000 by computing certain uh, quantity already uh, on board. Uh, this is the uh, uh, control room at CERN. And uh, it was provided in part by uh, the director general of CERN. And uh, it was. Uh, uh, accepted by NASA as a, as a payload operation center for, uh, for AMS, and you see Professor Ting here in the uh, control room. Uh, the people are there uh, seven hours, uh, seven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, there are many tasks to be performed, and one of them uh, is the uh, thermal control of the experiment, since uh, the temperature uh, on AMS, which is in vacuum outside uh, the uh, crew quarter, uh, is, uh, the temperature is changing constantly uh, because of the change of the uh, solar better angle, position of the SS ISS radiators, the uh, solar arrays, and possibly the attitude of the, of the ISS. Uh, this, is the, this is showing the uh, definition of this uh, beta angle, which is angle between the ve solar vector and the plane of the orbit, and this angle changes from minus 75 plus 75 degrees, so one can understand that the position of the sun with respect to AMS changes, or vice versa, and then 
the um, conditions uh, uh, vary continuously. Now, uh, the uh, radiators, like, uh, like this one, uh, change in position, and you see an example here, uh, where uh, over a matter of, uh, of, of hours, the position of this radiator changed, and the temperature in one of the uh, elements, this is a, a pump uh, for the TRRD uh, system, changed by several degrees, and, w and as we want to uh, keep uh, this detector to a temperature uh, of plus or minus one, one degree or less, uh, we have to uh, intervene. Uh, this uh, shows the solar array position with respect to, uh, to AMS, and here again the position may, may vary, and again we have to uh, uh, act and uh, uh, be aware uh, of controlling uh, the detectors with where the temperature is changing. This is an example of a, of a circuit uh, for the, uh, the silicon tracker where we have a CO2 two-phase system uh, in order to uh, control the temperature and uh, we have of course the uh, electronics to read uh, temperature sensors. We have 142 temperature sensors on a silicon tracker so we can control 32 heaters and, and, and pumps. So, uh, uh, in, in conclusion, as far as this uh, experiment is concerned, uh, the objective is uh, constantly to uh, make sure that the signal uh, from uh, the transition radiation detector is uh, uniform to 1%, that the uh, resolution of the silicon tracker uh, does not change from uh, the 10 micrometers. The uh, calorimeter has to measure the energy of electrons and put it on to 3%. The uh, time of flight system uh, uh, has to keep its resolution of 160 picoseconds. The magnet field has to be monitored and the rich uh, Cherenkov counter has to measure the velocity uh, to uh, one part in 1,000. So this has to be kept uh, completely <coughs> con continuously uh, up to date. Uh, what we are uh, measuring are uh, first uh, the uh, various uh, nuclei which uh, reach uh, AMS uh, from uh, helium, proton helium up to the ion region. Uh, we measure their energies uh, and we measure their flux. Uh, 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 this is important for us as uh, uh, to make the measurements I mentioned, in particular to search for particle of dark matter. Uh, we need to know very well what is this uh, flux, uh, which constitutes some background for the very rare events we are looking for. Uh, so we need to know very precisely uh, the flux of those uh, uh, nuclei. Uh, I notice also that could be very useful information for other purposes. Uh, uh, in, uh, in space if we have a continuous measurement of the flux of all the nuclei from, uh, from uh, proton to, uh, to the ion uh, region. Uh, this shows uh, uh, in, in the log plot here uh, the expected uh, positron-electron uh, uh, ratio as a function of energy that uh, we uh, measure. Uh, this is this curve. This is the production of positron by normal uh, interaction of cosmic rays with interstellar uh, matter. But what we'll be looking at, and this is a simulation, is a deviation from this curve by uh, similar uh, data, uh, which would uh, represent here uh, a 200 GeV, 400 GeV, or 800 GeV mass uh, neutrally no uh, of, uh, of dark matter. So we'll be looking for deviation from this curve showing uh, uh, something uh, particular. Now uh, I can show you that uh, indeed we are uh, measuring electrons and, and, and positron. Uh, <coughs> this is a, a, a sketch of the various detectors I have, I have briefly explained. You see uh, in color the various signals providing by uh, the uh, electronics for uh, one uh, event. A track has been fitted in one projection and then you have the other perpendicular projection. So we have in space a track and this track has been uh, measured to be an electron 
uh, at a very high uh, energy, one tera electron volt. This is the first time that in space an electron of that energy has been uh, identified. Uh, we can, uh, in space, uh, uh, reject uh, protons when we are looking for electron and uh, positron uh, with a high efficiency for, for electron uh, as, as we did uh, on the ground before the experiment was uh, launched. Uh, I show you here uh, some uh, positron uh, events and you see uh, that uh, there are uh, tracks of positrons so we are collecting collecting a positron at also energies which are higher than what has been measured before. Those show an example of the uh, functioning of the rich Cherenkov counter, where you see the circles I have, I have mentioned corresponding to uh, a, a nucleus uh, uh, of uh, different type. Uh, this is deon, this is aluminum, this is uh, silicon, uh, etc. So this is uh, working uh, very well. We can correlate two detectors. This is the charge measured uh, by the time of flight versus the uh, charge measured by the silicon tracker. And you see how we can identify uh, the various uh, nuclei. I'll show you now two uh, examples of, of, of two phenomena that uh, uh, we, we observe. Uh, the first one is uh, the spectrum of uh, helium uh, nuclei. Uh, over a very large uh, energy range, up to one TV. Uh, this, uh, these data here uh, have been taken when uh, the uh, space station is in the polar uh, region. And uh, we can take data uh, when we go closer to the equator equatorial region, where the magnetic field of the Earth, which is shown here, is stronger and we observe a cutoff in the spectrum, which means that uh, indeed we understand uh, why a lower energy particle cannot reach this uh, orbit because they are uh, deflected by the Earth magnetic field. Now, uh, another uh, example is uh, a similar uh, plot. Number of events is a function of, uh, of, of energy. Uh, you see in black, again, uh, the uh, spectrum of, uh, of helium uh, in the polar region and here in the equatorial region. Now, the, the data in red were taken during a solar flare uh, period, and what you see is an increase in the number of helium uh, nucleus. This is something which we still have to uh, interpret. So uh, we are collecting uh, data, a lot of data. Uh, but we also have to simulate uh, those data in order to make the uh, comparison be before uh, fin finding uh, final uh, results. We need to produce a lot of uh, Monte Carlo simulation uh, data uh, in order to uh, come to a conclusive uh, result, which we think uh, will start to flow by the end of this year. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, we have some uh, expectation uh, with AMS uh, looking for dark matter, antimatter, and strangelets. But we also have to uh, uh, observe that uh, uh, with very large facilities, those are uh, accelerators, and this is an uh, underground uh, experiment in a, in a mine in Japan, and this is the Hubble Space uh, Telescope. We observe that uh, what the, uh, those facilities uh, have been uh, built for, usually, uh, are quite different from uh, the uh, final observation. Whilst in the Super Cameo Candy here, it was built essentially to search for proton decay, and what has been found is something very important today, is that uh, neutrinos uh, oscillate and have, and have a mass. The Hubble Space Telescope uh, has uh, uh, produced uh, data showing that uh, uh, on top of the matter and, anti and antimatter and dark matter, which I have mentioned, the universe also contains something called dark energy. So for AMS, we, I have a question mark here. Uh, I think what is important is to build an uh, experiment with a, with a precise uh, detector in order to be uh, able to detect uh, what uh, uh, you have not uh, foreseen. Well, for us, the cosmo cosmos is, is now the ultimate laboratory. Cosmic rays can be observed uh, at energies higher than any accelerator uh, we can imagine. And of course, the most exciting objective uh, of AMS is, is still uh, to probe the unknown, 
to search for phenomena which uh, exist in nature, but that we have not uh, imagined or had not the tools to uh, discover. Uh, thank you very much. I think Maurice will uh, take some questions. Uh, I think a Blue Ribbon Committee looked at this experiment and uh, they said it would lead to fundamental discoveries. And in fact, they said uh, if it was successful, it would justify the space station completely. There's just one experiment. So I think uh, what they worked on and what they've done has uh, really been an amazing experiment. And uh, I think to have worked together for so long uh, with so many uh, institutions and so many uh, countries uh, is a great example of how you can pull a team together and, and be successful. So uh, if any questions, uh, Maurice will be glad to try and answer them. Go ahead. magnet from a super conducting to the uh, uh, the usual magnet and uh, was it uh, you know made possible because uh, uh, you had the uh, usual magnet uh, from the previous uh, you know model <coughs> yes indeed I hope you you hear me I think you hear me yes indeed I mean the uh, uh, objective of the second uh, detector for AMS was to uh, equip it with a superconducting magnet uh, uh, and uh, we have built this magnet uh, we have uh, built the cryogenic, uh, and it was to be, to be uh, flown uh, with a supply of helium lasting for about three years. Now, when the news came that uh, the life of the uh, International Space Station would be extended by a longer time, uh, we decided to take advantage of that, and we replaced this uh, superconducting magnet by uh, the magnet that we had flown uh, before, uh, we modified some of the layout of the silicon tracker so that we would uh, uh, regain uh, the uh, momentum measurement that uh, we were losing by uh, replacing a superconducting magnet by the permanent magnet. And uh, I think we are very glad that we did it. Now we can uh, really uh, continue to take measurements for uh, a much uh, longer time. Well, I think you can see that uh, this is a very complex uh, instrument. And uh, what they had done is uh, they had successfully uh, installed magnets and, uh, and had it all checked out, all assembled. And uh, two years ago when they were over here giving uh, their presentation, uh, I think uh, uh, Sam Ting mentioned to Maurice uh, about changing the magnets out. So that was done after the whole device was completely assembled, checked out in Europe and they, so they had to take those magnets out and put the new ones in. And uh, I think it's a really a, it's credit to the team that they could do that and do it so successfully. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, with a two kilohertz uh, sampling rate or frame rate, uh, are you able to precisely pinpoint the source of any antimatter you would see? And uh, would you expect a homogeneous background of antimatter, or would you expect point sources? sort of like gamma ray sources. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, we are uh, taking data at uh, uh, two kilohertz. Uh, those data are essentially uh, uh, charged particles, but we also have, and I did not mention it, uh, the possibility, and we do, to uh, detect uh, high energy gamma rays. Okay? Now, uh, 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 we do not, uh, 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 we cannot identify the sources of charged particles we do measure their direction, the direction where they come from, but since the uh, magnetic field in the galaxy is uh, uh, sufficiently large uh, to uh, uh, disturb the direction of uh, charged particles, you cannot point directly to, to the source. However, with the uh, gamma rays, which uh, of course are not influenced by the magnetic field, then we would be able to point uh, to the source and we have the means to uh, uh, know precisely the direction of, uh, of gamma rays. Leroy?
Well, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I think uh, everybody uh, uh, in this room uh, is a big believer in international cooperation and applauds that this uh, very visible success. Uh, what was the driver for uh, having such international participation in this? Was this a program objective, or was it simply that these different countries were able to produce uh, the best components for their purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was indeed the case. I mean, uh, uh, the, the goal in the beginning was, was very clear, to search for, for antiparticle in space. Uh, and to that, you needed to uh, find a, a redundant system, very precise system. So we had to find the proper team uh, in the world to be able to do that. And we found some team in Germany, some in Italy, in Switzerland, and uh, uh, in the US. Uh, fortunately, we found also uh, the colleagues in Taiwan, uh, which had the uh, capability and the opportunity uh, to build much of the electronics. So this is how uh, uh, a scientific collaboration uh, uh, is, is formed. Well, it, uh, well, I think bringing all those uh, countries together, 16 countries as he said, but if you look at it from a component standpoint, uh, how many more countries are involved over and above the 16? There are many more countries. Uh, how many do would you estimate, Maurice? Yeah, I Another mean, another hundred. Much, much of the uh, equipment is ordered around the world when, when, when needed. Was assembled by those teams, but uh, yes, do dozens and dozens of countries were involved. So you're looking at something that really is truly international. But I would say this is very common in this kind of uh, of, of, of research. Uh, uh, science does not know any, any, any border, uh, fortunately, and we've been able to work uh, at CERN, for example, uh, with uh, countries on both sides of the Iron Curtain for a long time, and uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, I can tell you that at CERN now, which was a, a previously a fully uh, only a European organization, now the goal is to make it uh, more global, and uh, countries around the world are asked to, to join. So we have now uh, clearly a, a mo movement in this uh, international research which uh, goes from region to, to the gl more global uh, world. And uh, I would point out that China is represented already on the space station. <laughs> Any other questions? I was wondering if the AMS uh, helps map the South Atlantic anomaly, and uh, does it help to uh, bring new information to that uh, anomaly area? I, I would say no. Uh, uh, on the contrary, I mean uh, the the rate in this uh, in this region is is is, is rather high, and it's uh, too high for taking the data we want to take. So in fact, uh, we either neglect those data or we turn off. Uh, our equipment when we are uh, in this region. The, the, the flux in the South Atlantic anomaly is a, a rather low energy, and we are interested mostly in very high energy particles. So as you know, many of us are here to argue the case for humans in space. Are the astronauts on the space station and cosmonauts helpful in this project? Yes, indeed, and I can tell you a story. Uh, during uh, AMS-1, uh, the data, like AMS-2, uh, was supposed to go through the TDRS uh, satellite system. However, the antenna in the cargo bay of Discovery uh, did not work uh, after launch. So what we had to do is to ask the astronauts to uh, change uh, the hard disk on our laptop computer or computer uh, in <laughs> at their disposal. And uh, Franklin Chan Diaz did that, and he came down with all our data, 30 hard disks, uh, and uh, if the astronauts had not been there, uh, our data would have been lost. I think it's an excellent example of uh, how the uh, two programs, the robotic and the Eman program, complement each other, as is the Hubble. Any other questions? Well, Maurice, uh, thank you very much for uh, an excellent presentation. Thank you, Josh.
and we, uh, we really appreciate you coming over uh, all the way from CERN to uh, give us this presentation this evening. So I think that, uh, that uh, ends the evening. Uh, we don't have any orchestra for you to dance to, uh, but we can probably put some music on if you'd like. So, but other than that, uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning at uh, 9 o'clock. No, actually, we'll have breakfast before that, but we'll start at 9 o'clock. <laughs>